y'all, Jamie with Country Diggers. Today we're going to do a little history on Alfield. Uh, she's the princess who turned pirate. So we'll be doing her. Hope y'all enjoy. This is princesses behaving badly again. So hope y'all right, enjoy. This is princesses behaving badly uh, by Linda Rodriguez McRoby. McRoby. And today we're talking about Alfield, the princess who turned pirate, circa 5th century, the icy waters of the Baltic Sea. Princess Alfield had a choice to make. On one hand, a really awesome guy had finally managed to bypass her father's deadly defenses and call on her without being beheaded or poisoned. She could marry this brave young man and enjoy a life of domestic bliss that women of her era were supposed to aspire to. Or she could give up royal life and become a pirate. Guess which path she chose. The only daughter of a fiercely protected 5th century goth king, Seward, little Afhild, uh, was raised to be modest, almost pathologically so. <clears throat> she was supposed, supposedly so modest that she kept her face muffled in a robe, lest the sight of her incredible beauty provoke any nearby man to go mad with lust. Alfield had good reason to be so dedicated to preserving her chastity. Her story appears in the Gesta Dan Danorum, Deeds of the Danes, a 12th century multi-volume work in Latin by historian Saxo Germanicus. If Saxo is to be, be believed, virginity was pretty much the only currency a woman had had, but covering her face was just one of the measures taken to keep her untouched by man. According to Saxo, King Seward did what any father of a pretty teenage daughter would do if he could. He banished her into very close keeping and gave her a viper and a snake to rear. Wishing to defend her chastity by the protection of these reptiles when they came to grow up, for it would have been hard to pry into her chamber when it was barred by so dangerous a bolt. He also enacted that if any man tried to enter it and failed, he must straightaway yield his head to be taken off and impaled on a stake. The terror which was thus attached to wantonness chastened the heated spirits of the young men. There was, however, one young man whose heated spirits were inflamed by these strictures, who thought that peril of the attempt only made it bolder. His name was Alf, and he was the son of the Danish king Seagar. One day Alf burst into Alf, Alfhild's chambers, clad in a bloody animal hide to drive the reptiles insane, obviously. He killed the viper, tossing a red-hot piece of steel down its gullet. The snake he dispatched by more traditional means, a spear to the throat. Though impressed by how the rash young Dane had destroyed his reptilian defenses, Seward would accept him only if Alfhild made a free and decided choice in his favor. Alfhild was definitely charmed by the brave suitor who had just killed her delightful pets. Her mother, however, was not. She told Alfhild to search her mind and not, be, not to be captivated by charming looks or forget to judge his virtue. Swayed by her mother's wise counsel, Alfhild decided that Alf was not the man for her. 
Instead, she decided to trade her modesty for men's clothing and go to a sea as a rampaging pirate, leading a crew of lady buccaneers as you do. Yes. Uh, why Alfield decided to become a pirate is unclear. Saxo made no attempts to explain her reasons, nor does he say why the many maidens who were of the same mind and accompanied her were of the same mind. Okay. Um, many maidens were of the same mind, and those who accompanied her were of the same mind. Despite her unconventional decision, Affield's story was typical of historical lore of the period in one important way. The overprotection of chastity to the, <coughs> excuse me, to the exclusion of both fun and safety speaks to the realities and values of ancient Scandinavia. And it's certainly a piece of a piece with other shield maiden stories romantic tales of virgin warrior queen virgin warrior women who put down needlework and took up arms although he does little to explain her motivation saxo took pla uh, <clears throat> pains to note that afield though unusual in her adaption of the life of a war warlike rover wasn't entirely unique. Other women, he claimed, abhorred dainty living and traded their natural softness and light-mindedness light for swords and weapons. They unsexed themselves, devoting those hands to the lance which they should rather have applied to the loom. They assailed men with their spears, whom they could have melted with their looks. They thought of death and not dalliance. Women, according to Saxo, should be off doing lady things and keeping their pretty faces hidden as not to inflame the passions of unsuspecting men. That's men's unbridled passion. That men's unbridled passion was hazardous, hazardous <laughs> enough to drive women to take up a weapon doesn't seem to have crossed his mind. <laughs> In any case, Affield was a raging success as a pirate, given that becoming a pirate wasn't simply a matter of picking up a cutlass and slapping on an eye patch. Exactly how or why she succeeded is lost to the ages. Saxo is rather stingy with the details. But despite his prudish misgivings on the subject of women warriors, he concedes that Affield did deeds beyond the valor of woman. Hmm. She, led a, she led her lady mates to great riches, eventually becoming captain of yet another crew, this time of male pirates, who were entranced by her beauty and devoted to her badassness. In time, Afield amassed a fleet of ships that preyed on vessels cruising the waters off Finland. But the good times were about to come to an end. Afield hadn't reckoned on one thing, the doggedness of her rejected snake-slaying suitor, Alf. Alf had had never given up on the beautiful, modest maiden and pursued her on many toilsome voyages over ice-locked seas through several of his own pirate battles while sailing the coast of Finland. One day, he and his crew came upon a flotilla of pirate ships. His men were against attacking such a large fleet with their few vessels, but Alf would have none of it, claiming that it would be shameful if anyone should report to Affield that his desire to advance could be checked by a few ships in the path. Oh, the irony of the... <laughs> okay. 
As the sea battle raged on, the Danes between being massacred being massacred wondered where their enemies got such such grace of bodily beauty and such supple limbs. <laughs> Alf along with his comrade in arms, Borger, stormed one of the enemy ships and made for the stern, slaughtering all that withstood him. But when Bolger knocked the helmet off the nearest pirate, Alf saw to his astonishment that it was none other than the beautiful Alfie. The woman whom he had sought over land and sea in the face of so many dangers. At that moment, Alf realized that he must fight with kisses and not with arms that the cruel spears must be put away and the enemy handled with gentler dealings. Those gentler, gentler dealings included getting Alfield out of those sweaty sailor's clothes and into Alf's warm bed. <laughs> and so the plunderings were over, for Alfield at least. The language Saxo uses to describe Affield's return to Princess Life is particularly telling. He writes that Alf took hold of her eagerly, made her change her man's apparel, and afterwards begot her with a daughter. <laughs> what Affield wanted and how she felt about giving up her roving adventures is unknown, probably because Saxo didn't really care. The words he chose made it clear that Affield did not have a choice. After that, history, or Saxo at least, has nothing more to say about her. Saxo's tale of modest princess turned pirate may or may not be true. After all, the Gesta Danarum is a history that includes giants, witches, and dragons alongside real-life heroes and rulers. Still, Affield's life is a woman warrior, as a woman warrior is likely based in a, true, in a real tradition. And whether true or not, her story and others in Saxo's rich tapestry of historical lore was claimed, by, claimed to be instructed by later scholars and historians in understanding early and middle Scandinavian culture. But what exactly did it teach future generations? Those children who would have listened to the tale all snuggled up around the fire on one of those endless Scandinavian winter nights. It's hard to say. To the modern reader, it's disappointing to see Afhild's exploits subdued by man and marriage. Why couldn't she have been a wife and a mother and a pirate? <laughs> but before judging the story by a yardstick of 21st century feminist values, let's remember that Saxo was recording his version of Danish history for a Christian audience living some 700 years after Affield's lifetime. In Saxo's hands, Afhild's saga itself, based on centuries-old pagan oral tradition, reinforces Christian gender norms. Afhild is modest and chaste, but also handy with an axe and a sword, in keeping with shield maiden folklore. Af must somehow overcome her fierceness to be worthy of her, and of course, everything works out in the end because Afhill gives up a life of a warlike rover to settle down in a role in her role of wife and mother. Saxo makes it clear how he feels about such women in arms. In fact, he spends more time laminating them than he does describing Afhill's life. So in its way, the story of Afhill is much like a a fairy tale as Cinderella or Snow White. It just has more swashbuckling and snakes. <laughs> Hope y'all like that little tale. Don't like as like <clears throat> the book says. Don't know if that's true or not. 
but uh, it probably was. Um, some aspects of it anyway. Anyway, hope y'all enjoyed this installment of Princess Behaving Badly. And stay tuned for the next installment. All right. See ya.